We're going to get started with our afternoon session. Um, before the next break, we have two really nice talks. Um, one from Dr. Kloss is from North, uh, Northeastern University, and also we'll hear our second uh, technical talk from the MediaTek folks. So uh, to introduce Dr. Kloss, we're going to pass this off to Yusuf. Thank you. So uh, we are uh, pleased to have uh, Professor Paul Kalasas here um, um, from Northeastern University. Um, Paul received his PhD, uh, MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from uh, University of UPC Barcelona in uh, 2003 and 2009, as well as MS in advanced mathematics from UPC in 2014. He is assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering departments at Northeastern University. His primary interests include statistical signal processing, stochastic filtering, robust statistics with application to positioning systems, wireless communication, and mathematical biology. Among other distinctions, he is the recipient of NSF Career Award, 2014 uh, Eurasip PhD Thesis Award, and nine Doran Failwell Award for Technology Research, and 2016 Early Achievement Award in recognition of his contribution to navigation, system, and signal processing fields. He has served in organization, uh, flagship of IEEE conferences, and many journals. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Yasu, for the, for the introduction. So let me start by thanking the organizers for organizing this really nice event and inviting me. So give me the chance to, to share with you some of the research that we are doing. Uh, so in particular, I'm going to talk, given the, the audience, uh, I'm going not to talk, but maybe to, to share our experience of, on software defined radio uh, as applied to position navigation and timing uh, applications. So let me give you a bit of background. So my, my, my background, my research, as, as uh, Yusuf ju just mentioned, is on signal processing. So I'm a signal processor. I'm interested on, on DSP methodologies and basically apply them to improve how GPS receivers operate. Right, so to make them more robust to interferences, more robust to multipath, urban canyon, sensor fusion, so all this sort of, uh, of uh, stuff. Uh, so then you know how this works. So you develop your algorithm. Let's say you develop a new signal to noise ratio estimator that you think it's very cool. Then you want to test it. And we typically, what we do is we test it on our very simple MATLAB simulator with some inputs, outputs, validate the performance, have some picture some curves and then present a paper and, and that's it. But then some years ago we, we realized, okay, uh, what, how can we actually validate that this signal to noise ratio estimator, to say an example, impacts the whole receiver chain when you implement this onto a GPS receiver, right? And then this actually is a bit of a challenge because then you need to implement a whole end-to-end -end GPS receiver to do that and that's, that's very challenging. So, and this is how this adventure with playing with software defined radio basically started. So we start playing with new radio and we basically had our goal was to develop an end-to-end -end GPS receiver. So hopefully well programmed so that then later we can play around with the algorithms, which is basically my, my basic interest. So develop new algorithms, implement them and see how they behave in the end-to-end in the -end, uh, receiver. So having said that, this talk is about this precisely. So this journey that started maybe 10 years ago, where we start this, uh, what we call this uh, GNSS SDR uh, project. It's an open source project. So today I'm going to talk about uh, this a bit and also some applications or some uh, examples of use of this, uh, of this software. So anyone knows what GNSS stands for? Right? So if I tell you GPS, I guess all of you will know it. So GNSS is basically a system of systems, right? Encomp encompassing GPS, but also Galileo, which would be, it's the, the you know, the, the European GPS, GLONASS, it's a Russian one that was designed by the same time, Beidou, which is the Chinese, and then some others, right? So when I say GNSS, I'm, I mean, you can think of it as, as GPS. Uh, and then why, why didn't we use uh, GPS SDR as the name for the project? So basically, first thing, it was already taken, so <laughs> bad luck. But then also we want to give it more of a broad uh, aspect to it, so this is why we call it the G GNSS SDR, 
which probably is not a very sexy name, but this is what we came up 10 years ago. Now we are stick with it, so we cannot, we cannot change it. All right, so let me give you a bit more of a motivation about this talk. Uh, uh, so now location and positioning systems are everywhere, so we use it uh, everywhere. So it becomes a, a commodity in many applications. And as such, there are a lot of uh, you know, integrated circuit designers that implement their own GPS and on ASIC, so you can buy them or use the ones on smartphones, right? And then use it if you are actually only interested in, in computing the position and, and making some use out of it. So you can use this, for instance, you, if you go Google this Android API for, to actually measure or to, to get the, the signals from your smartphones related to GNSS or, or GPS if you want, you will have uh, functions as, such as these ones in here. So get latitude, get longitude, get speed, get accuracy, which are very high level uh, type of uh, queries that you can make from the receiver, right? But as I was mentioning, my, my interest or the interest of, of the people whom I collaborate with also uh, is on developing new algorithms. So what if you are not actually interested in just getting the position and using it to track a bike, but you're interested in knowing how this position was computed, or you want to test new algorithms to compute position or to implement a certain specific signal to noise ratio estimator, as I was uh, doing, uh, mentioning before. So this is basically how we get, got started thinking about these uh, SDR usage in terms of, uh, of uh, GNSS receivers. Uh, also, besides this more academic uh, um, flavor to it, there's also some exciting landscape in the GNSS community because there's a lot of new signals coming in. So typically we're using GPS and GLONASS, but now there are all these sorts of uh, systems, Galileo, Beirut, they are uh, actually very active now. There are multiple signals, multiple frequencies that are being transmitted. So we need actually to develop new receivers that are able to, to actually capture and, and track all these signals and make some good use of it. And we need to do this very fast. You know? And then if we have to develop and wait for a manufacturer to develop an ASIC, that will take a uh, whole life, right? So we need to, it's very convenient in that sense, the, the usage of uh, software-defined radio, all right? Uh, and besides, there's this DSP you know, platforms, they are becoming more and more powerful as, as we know. I mean, if you have a look at the, at the stands and, and the booth of the, and the conference. So this is the kind of the outline of the talk today. So uh, I would like to introduce a bit GNSS technology and, and how the receiver works, just for you to know or to appreciate what we are doing later on in the software defense radio GNSS receiver. Uh, but maybe it would be good to know, do you, um, to, to see how much detail you want me to, to give about the GNSS receiver, are you already familiar with GPS at least or, or not, how this operates, what is the signal that is transmitted or you want me to go briefly? Okay, I think we can go like a very, like 10,000 feet overview or maybe even 20,000 feet overview about that. Uh, okay, so I'll give you a brief overview of GNSS and then I'll tell you what were the design principles that we followed when we started 10 years ago thinking about developing this receiver. I'll tell you about the GNSS SDR project and you know that this is the, the, all the, the platform and the uh, ecosystem that is around it and I'll give you finally some examples that, of use of it that we have been working on for the last years. So before uh, I would like to thank also like a list of collaborators, which is basically the, the guys with whom I'm working on, on this open source project for the last 10 years, and we are very active on this. Uh, so if someone can take a picture, I will send it to him, to them. <laughs> so also, uh, I'd like to mention also that this project has been given various support from, from international and, and national agencies here. So particularly we've been funded by the Google Summer of Code since 2013, so basically uh, giving access to three to six students to work on the project for, for the summer. We had also projects from the European Space Agency, NSF, and also the Euro European Union. So because the team is just spread all over the place, so that's why we are able to, to secure some funding from, from these agencies. 
All right, so uh, GNSS in a nutshell, or this overview. So I, uh, now we already mentioned that GNSS is this large term that englo uh, englobes this, uh, or gathers this uh, general concept to locate a receiver based on a satellite of, a constellation of satellites, right? So this you need to think of GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, all these sort of uh, uh, technologies. This is uh, the spectrum sharing or the, the, you know, the, the frequency allocation for this system. So you see it's a bit crowded. Uh, in, in yellow, you'll see the GPS bands. So the, what you have here, L1, let's see. Uh, the course, where is that? So this one here, L1, is the one that we typically use. This this open service that JPS is providing. So that's the one that, that we use typically on our smartphones. So you, you see that it is shared with the E1 band from Galileo. So this allows for having the same radio frequency front end, gathering this data from these two systems, and then you can post process it, or you can process it uh, using your software defined radio, but just with this single front end. But then there are other uh, frequencies that are being transmitted in different bands, like these ones on L5 on the lower end of the spectrum. All of them are transmitted on the L band, which is between one to two gigahertz roughly. And each of these signals, they share similar properties, but they need to be processed separately. They have their own you know, details and, and insights. Uh, and then finally, I would like to mention that when you think of a GNSS receiver, it's not that you buy or that you implement a GPS-only receiver or a Galileo-only receiver, but the receivers need to be multi-constellation. It's typically GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo receiver. So that's kind of one of the challenges also in developing these uh, receivers. Uh, so now, maybe just to give you a, a full list of what's available out there, not that you really need to take, uh, uh, you need to remember all these details, but just to mention nowadays, as of today, we have these four systems available covering the Earth with satellites, sending signals, and then each of these uh, systems is transmitted at different frequencies. Right? For instance, GPS has 24 satellites in orbit, operate, operative. There are some others that are spare, spare uh, satellites, but there are 45, 24 satellites transmitting at these three different uh, bands. GLONASS has two bands, Galileo three bands, and Beidou three other uh, frequency bands. All right, so in total, if you think of this, we have more than 100 signals being transmitted. So we need to be able to process them on a receiver. So it's actually, and these signals are being developed and modernized, so we also need to be able to readjust the receiver and, and, and adapt to the new signals that are being transmitted. Right? So that's, that's, a very, uh, that's a playground, right, for, the, for software defined radio uh, practitioners and, and, and enthusiasts. So how this basically operates uh, GPS receivers, so as I was mentioning, we have these signals transmitted on, on the L band. These signals are transmitted at different frequencies. We can use one frequency, we can use two or three. It depends on the capabilities of the front end of the receiver. These signals are basically transmitted, tran transmitting, or the purpose of these signals is to first be able to compute a, a range estimate between the receiver and the satellite. Right? From this, we will be able to, given that we know the satellite positions, we can solve a, a geometrical problem and then infer or estimate where the receiver is. The second purpose is to transmit some navigation data, which is very low rate, but it's necessary. Basically, this navigation data, it's telling you where the satellites are, let's say. So this is mainly the main purpose of all these signals that we need to synchronize and demodulate. That's the purpose of the SDR or the, of the, or the receiver, the GNSS receiver in general. Uh, just maybe this same thing, if with some equations, sometimes for some of you, or for all of you, probably will be uh, easier to, to get the idea of what I'm talking about. So basically the receiver is receiving this signal, which is the combination of signals from M satellites, right? So we have the antenna and then we receive signals from all these uh, satellites, we call it X, theta, Vi, and some extra noise. Always we have noise, right? This is what gives us uh, jobs for as engineers. If we don't have noise, then that's, there's nothing to do for us, right? So this, each of these signals is, contains this, all these components, right? So this B is these bits that tells us where the satellites are. Each of these signals has its own code. 
that is unique for the satellite, right? So then we know which satellite are we receiving, given that we know the code, that this is, for, we know the code, at least for the, for the civilian uh, applications or the, for, for the civilian uh, signals. And then these signals that we receive, they are delayed due to the propagation. And then this delay is what tells us about the distance from the receiver to the, to the satellites. And then we can use this information to, to estimate the position of the receiver. So we are interested in these delays. All right, so this is how, very roughly, how a, a GNSS receiver looks like. So we'll have this hardware part, this radio frequency front end, that in SDR we, we are trying to push it as much as we can towards the antenna, right? So to convert these signals into the, go to the digital domain as soon as possible, and then get into the DSP part of the receiver. This is our main interest, or our, my main interest at least. So this DSP part, uh, contains basically we need to do several tasks. One basically the main the, the most important one is to synchronize the receiver with the satellite. Then this synchronization meaning the computing these distances to the satellites. And then we go to this navigation solution that will give us this position, velocity and time estimate. Right? So that's kind of a two steps uh, process here. So if we think of the DSP part, there are certain uh, aspects of it or certain signal processing things that we need to do. Basically, there are two. We need to do acquisition and then tracking. So acquisition meaning we need to know which are the satellites that we have in view, first thing, and get a rough estimate of the time delay and the Doppler shift of that satellite. And we need to do this for each of the satellites. Now once we detect that the satellite is present, we transmit or we we use these course estimates of the time delay and Doppler shifts to the tracking DSP part that will keep track of that satellite, right? And then we'll refine this uh, time delay estimates so this will go into the navigation solution and provide us with a hopefully good estimate of the position. So this is the part that we are interested in this uh, GNSS SDR project mainly, this DSP. Uh, so maybe Mm, forget uh, about the details, but basically uh, what I want to tell you here, I can send you the slides later or make it available, is that this acquisition part, so how we do, do we decide whether the satellite is present or not, is by correlating our uh, local code that we know for that satellite with a signal that we have, uh, that we are receiving, right? And if this, this correlation exceeds a threshold, then we determine that the, the signal is present. And if it doesn't exceed that threshold, we determine that the, that satellite is not present. All right? So let me show you some picture, which would be probably nicer. So here you have uh, the case on this uh, left-hand side figure. You have the, the case where the satellite is present that we are looking for, right? So we correlate the signal, and we do this for every possible time delay and Doppler shift, which is bounded. So then we build this kind of map here and look for the maximum, right? If the signal is present and it has enough power, you will have something like this with very strong power uh, for that satellite. So you will determine that the signal is present. If the signal is not present and the satellite is not present, you'll have this other uh, situation here where you basically have only noise. Now the trick is how you adjust the threshold and so on, so that's where this DSP part comes in. The only catch of this is that each of these computations is very expensive. So calculating each of these points in the grid, it takes a lot of time, so there are efficient ways to do that, either using FFT, this is why also the SDR, it's, it's also very, very appealing for as in, for implementing GNSS receivers. We can also think of using like low level assembly level uh, type of correlation. And well, basically what I'm trying to say is that this is the part where we are consuming more and more power and computational resources, right? So once this is, uh, the, we have this course estimate given by this maximum, this will be thrown to the tracking algorithm that basically will track this, this peak, this maximum as it moves because the satellites are moving, so the time delay will be also changing. So we need to track this over time and compute position out of it. So this is what this tracking is doing, basically using phase lock loops, delay lock loops, basically tracking that maximum just with a few samples. So then this part is less computationally intensive. 
All right, so once we have this and we have these time delays for several satellites, let's say more than four, we can compute uh, position, velocity, and time estimates. So remember, GNSS is not only about position, but also time. So with these receivers, you can get really, really accurate atomic grade, actually, a clock from a GPS receiver or a GNSS receiver. That's also an important feature. All right, so how are we doing on time? Okay. So basically summarizing this nutshell GNSS uh, in a nutshell thing. So this GNSS is quickly evolving because this, we have all these signals uh, coming in and also because to tackle these and other challenges for, from uh, GNSS, we, are, we need to develop new methodologies also in acquisition, tracking, the modulation, how we compute position, and so on. So SDR is actually a very appealing uh, framework for us to, to do that. And that's why we started thinking about this some years ago. So hopefully it was not too fast. I would be happy to tell you more about GNSS in general. Uh, but let me move to, to the GNSS SDR project, which uh, probably relates more to the, to the, the topic of the conference. Uh, and so in this set of slides, I'll try you to, to tell you how we came up with this uh, project 10 years ago and how we evolved from basically an idea to what we have now, where we have this open source project that's becoming very popular. We have many people um, contributing to it from all over the world. So basically, we started with a work cloud like this one, where we put everything that we need or that we wanted to have our GNSS receiver by then, and we had nothing then. So basically, I uh, would say that we had like keywords that had to do with GNSS, so the constellations, the techniques, the different techniques, the different acquisition methods, uh, performance metrics, and we have also some other set of, uh, so for this first set, we had, this is what we were more confident about, right, because we were working on GNSS for many years, and uh, the other set that we can find here are more related on, to, on the, to the implementation, right? So, for instance, we want this software to be multi-threading. We want this to be tested and documented and very flexible so we can plug it into different platforms and so on, right? So that was kind of our wish list. So for this, we were not that familiar, so we partnered with uh, computer architects and we start learning about this. Uh, components of the receiver. Uh, first, we started with some design principles that probably they are, well, it's basically common sense, but put on a slide. And most of you are already probably following it. So I, I'll try to link this to what we did on the GNSS SDR just to show you or to share with you the experience that we, that we had that we gained with this. So we tried not to not reinvent the wheel. So it was some, something was done. So if you have a good implementation of an FFT, you don't really need to do it again. So that's why we were leveraging also the new radio framework, right, to begin with. Follow design patterns, have a clean coding style that it's uh, on, the, on the website. We have the, the rules to, for the coding, uh, follow, to follow the coding styles of the project. Follow standards, try to have the software documented. And we follow a test-driven approach uh, while developing the, the software. So let me mention a bit about this items here related as related to the GNSS SDR project. So in terms of do not reinvent the wheel, we were leveraging like we were standing on the shoulders of giants, let's say. So we were leveraging a lot on new radio for the signal processing part. Uh, we, were use, we are using FFTW for, for Fourier transform implementations, boost the testing framework from Google, we found that it was very useful. And for linear algebra uh, type of operations, we are using Armadillo. Right? So all this is somehow used within the, within the project. We were also told by then, have this paper in 2010, about these design patterns. No? So the design patterns are basically common software problems that we find in many areas, not only in GNSS, that are well addressed by the software community. So we were trying to, to leverage them and, and try to follow them as much as possible. 
So let me show you some examples of how we were using this or how we are using it when designing initially the software. So I was telling you about these uh, different um, signal processing things that, or uh, signal processing blocks that we have to do for each of the satellites. Like we need to do acquisition and tracking for each of the satellites. And this is something that will be exactly the same so we need to replicate this for all of these satellites. So then we created this, uh, what we call the channel architecture pattern. It's basically a pattern that has acquisition and tracking and some other blocks that are necessary. And this is replicated. So now when you instantiate or when you create the project, then you can decide how many channels you want and, and how many channels you want to have for a specific satellite, right? So that, that became very, very useful afterwards when this is implemented. Uh, so you can see here within the flow graph of the receiver, so we have uh, our signal source. It can be a file or it can be a front end. We have some signal condition and these blocks in yellow, it's basically this channel architecture. They are exactly the same thing, but they will be used for different signals or different satellites if you want. So that's basically what I mean with this channel architecture pattern. So other, other uh, Typical examples of design patterns are state machines. So you want your receiver to operate differently depending on the state where, where it is uh, now at that, time in, at that point in time, right? So this is a good uh, common structure is these uh, state machines, no? finite state machines. So we are using it, we are leveraging all these within the software. So you can find them um, examples of this uh, pattern all over the place. So for instance, when we do this acquisition, so we start acquiring, looking for the, for the maximum of this grid. I was telling you, see if it exceeds the threshold, then it goes to another state, validates that within another snapshot, still this exceeds the threshold, then it goes, this sends uh, the receiver onto this other state where we go to tracking and keep tracking that satellite. So this is implemented as a state machine as well. So that's, again, it's more of a common sense thing uh, putting in practice. Right, so to avoid this going wide, because the receiver in the end will be, it's actually a very large software nowadays. We have also some message queuing pattern. All these software, all these uh, blocks that I was showing you here, they are uh, synchronizing, not synchronizing, they are sharing information between them in an asynchronous way. So we use this message queuing pattern to actually communicate between these two, these uh, different blocks that are connected one to the other. Okay, so this is, again, using this well-defined uh, message queuing pattern that we didn't create it ourselves, so we were leveraging what was already done. The stress-driven development, so we, we believe that we need to implement, when we implement a new tracking method or signal to near ratio method, so we try to first uh, design the test that we want to, this method to, to pass, Right, so it's basically a test-driven thing, uh, and then and then implement the test. So don't do it, uh, and then implement the, the DSP uh, processing. Right, not the other way around. So you can find on this uh, link uh, the process that we are that we are basically using. We have more than 200 units test uh, nowadays implemented to test the different functionalities of the receiver, but also the function the receiver at a whole. So. When doing that, we try or we need to make sure that once something new is implemented, let's say this SNR, this signal to nearest ratio estimator is implemented, it doesn't break down for some particular case, right? Because you want your test to be always passing, no? not, okay, it's kind of, it's floating. No, it should be, it should be fine. All right. Okay, so with all these design principles in mind, we now came up with this, which is now, it's relatively large project now. Uh, this GNSS SDR is basically this open source software defined radio, uh, or software defined receiver for a GNSS. Basically, it gets data from front ends or, or, or a file or a data file, process it and gets you with a position estimate. Nice thing. It, uh, it's very flexible, so you can implement any, any technique inside of it. You can also uh, 
uh, grab data from the different parts of this, so you can log data from raw, either raw data or flags or whatever you want. You can process it offline. The receiver also operates uh, in real time on multi-platform, and it's implemented in C++, leveraging the new radio uh, blocks for the signal processing. All right. So and it's it's free. So it's free as for free and. You, can, you are free of using it as, uh, in, in any way you want. So it's under the GPL license. So some of the features, uh, it's multi-platform, so now it works with Linux and Mac, no Windows. Uh, it's also multi-threaded. It operates on a variety of RF front ends. So the list is on the website. I, I recommend you to go there if you are interested. So they include, of course, USRPs. Uh, now we are uh, supporting GPS L1, L2, L5 signals, Galileo E1, E5 signals, so the frequencies, and GLONASS L1 and L2 uh, signals. So there's a whole bunch of them. We, are, we started only with GPS L1 10 years ago, and it's rapidly increasing now. The receiver also detects whether your uh, CPU is enabled to to have these SIMD instructions. So, so this correlation that I was mentioning that is very costly can be implemented using low level assemblies, assembly level uh, structure or, or instruction, sorry. Uh, we have also the ability to connect through TCP to MATLAB uh, and, then, and then extract data from the receiver as it runs so we can you know, plot the signal to noise ratio or, or these cross ambiguity functions I was mentioning before. The positioning part, so once we get these distance estimates to the receiver, we basically leverage the RTK lib, which is a very popular library for GNSS, providing you with very, very well implemented uh, positioning uh, systems uh, that you can get from meters to centimeter level accuracy, depending on the signals that you're using. So I recommend also looking at the website. Uh, and we have standard outputs like Rhinex, KML to plot it on Google Earth and whatnot. All right, so one of the things that we were very uh, glad to, we were one of the fir well, first, the first open source Genesis receiver to track a Galileo signal. That was in 2013, I think, yeah. Uh, so we were, you see here all the, you know, the, the experiment that we conducted. So that was kind of a, a boost for us to, to implement Galileo uh, but back then. That's the flow graph of the receiver. So you see here these little cues that I was mentioning. That's basically leveraging also new radio, inheriting new radio uh, philosophy, right? So we're, we were asynchronously connecting the different blocks. We have the, dif the signal source, the signal sync that I was mentioning, I can tell you a bit more later, and the different channels. These different channels can be processing different types of signals. <coughs> Uh, this you see here are some uh, of the features, more of the inputs, outputs. So we are supporting all sorts of RF front ends. Basically these USRPs, R, uh, RTL, SDRs, so others, uh, data grabbers and signal uh, generators. Uh, well, as I was mentioning, we can also process this data or dump this data to MATLAB and process it. And then the data will be generated also uh, through through this RTK lib or, or some other uh, formats, right? So the software architecture, uh, as it is, we have this control plane that reads a configuration file, so everything is text. With, through this configuration file, we can define how many channels we want, uh, which are the bands, the frequencies, that, the signals that we want to track. Uh, and then from these signals, it will generate these flow graphs, right, for the receiver. So it can be something relatively simple, like this thing here, where you have different channels processing uh, uh, the same, sign the same uh, frequency from a given constellation, or something a bit more complex, where let's say you have a front end that is able to uh, sends data from, from two different frequency bands, let's say L1 and L5, so we can split this through the signal conditioner, and then for each of these bands, we can generate a bunch of, of channels that will track GPS, another bunch of, of channels that can, gener that can acquire and track Galileo. Then the same thing for the other frequency, 
and then um, gather all that together to compute a position estimate. So you can think of all sorts of combinations there, or even track the same satellites with different algorithms. So this is more, maybe more academic and more research focused, so you can compare the performance of two different tracking algorithms, for, for instance. Okay, so the other stuff uh, about that, so we have this development ecosystem, so basically there's a, an ecosystem around the, the project that is revolving around this, the website here. I don't have access, I think, to, to the internet now, but you can check it. The, in the website, we have uh, tutorials and how to, on how to use this software. Also, we have uh, extensive documentation on the DSP blocks that are being implemented. So it's actually a very useful source, I would say. We have a Git repository also for the website. So we always find people looking for typos and then they upload, they put a push request or just to fix it or, or to add new material, right? So you can do that. The source code is on GitHub. We have all these issue tracker and so on and whatnot. So I, I'll, I'll highly uh, recommend if you have some spare time and are interested in this area to, to look at it. There's a lot of, of material. Sometimes it's even a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of, of stuff there. All right. So there's this, uh, in this documentation, we have these DSP blogs, tutorials, and, and stuff for developers if you want to, to play around with it. We use this Git branching model where we have this master that basically is the stable version. Uh, well, this is probably you are already familiar with this. And we have this next branch where we develop the new stuff, right? And eventually we'll, it will become the next uh, version or the, the next master. So you can check on, on GitHub. Everything is there for, and for you to, to review it. All right, so that was the basic, uh, uh, an overview, okay? about the, the GNSS SDR project. I can tell you more about this offline, but I wanted to use this last minutes talking about how we were using it or some examples for the last year. So there will be more pictures, maybe that's a bit more interesting. So first example of use, uh, that was in 2013. So we use this uh, RTL uh, SDR dongle that you, that you can tweak to, to to, you know, to tune it to different frequency bands, which cost nothing, basically, 20 bucks or so, 25. So we connected this to uh, an active antenna and a bias T that we developed ourselves so that the whole thing was less than 100 bucks by then and connected it to the SDR. And we were able to actually provide a position estimate using on GPS L1 only because by then we were only having GPS L1 signals. So that was kind of, we were interested in this, let's say, ultra low cost GNSS receiver. Uh, and then we basically build that. We see, you see here the setup, right? In, in here with the bias T, the antenna, and then the, the, the dongle connected to the computer. And then the computer is actually computing the, the position estimates. Here you'll see the, in yellow, I don't know if you can see it properly. Yeah, kind of. So you see here the, the error that we were committing, right? So that was in, in actually in Barcelona where, where this experiment was conducted. Uh, you see, okay, there's a bit, a bit of an error, but come on, the, the software was, <laughs> the hardware was very, was very bad, you know? so what else can we do? You have also here some link to a full page on the website describing how this experiment was performed, more performance metrics and so on, and a step-by-step also, the code is available, so you can you can play around with it. We have many people requesting on the on the mailing list of the website or the project. You know, still today, after so many years, that they are trying it and they have problems, so we help them to to basically build this very low cost receiver. So that's one of the the cases where we used this uh, SDR. The other, which is maybe on the other end, right? So that was uh, using a very cheap antenna. And the, if you go to the other extreme, you can think of multi-antenna receivers, right? Or antenna rate receivers. Basically, instead of having one antenna, you have multiple of them. And if you combine the signals of, this, of, this, uh, of these antennas smartly, 
you can do fun, uh, cool stuff like this one plotted here. So you have this antenna array with multiple satellite, uh, multiple antennas. You can point your your you know the steering beam of the antenna towards the satellites that you are interested, and maybe place nulls where there are interferences. No, maybe there's this guy jamming your signal. There's this communication tower also injecting some interference. So you want to know it. So you can do this when you have multiple antennas. So basically, again, this is research oriented now. So we develop our own antenna array. So that's not low cost, or it's as low cost as you can get, but it's not as the RTL, uh, RTL SDR, right? So you have here these eight antennas, you have a digital front end, you have all these radio frequency front ends that are very well synchronized. So it's kind of a really uh, challenging Hardware, piece of hardware, I would say. If you, if you ever work with a multi antenna arrays, you probably will appreciate this. Uh, but on the other side, this requires some uh, software that can, soft software receiver that can actually be adapted easily to, to this non standard setup, right? This is where we are we're actually leveraging the, the Genesis SDR software again. So we have these antennas, these radio frequency front ends, very well synchronized, the ADC. Now we have some FPGA implementing the beamforming, so how to actually null and, and place, uh, you know, to steer the beam towards the satellites. And this was controlled with the Genesis SDR receiver. So dumping signals there, computing positions and so on, and also computing the beam the information to, to steer the beam of that, uh, of that array, right? So kind of connecting that prototype thing with a software receiver that we just developed. We did some experiments also with uh, real data, right? We have this jam, someone was jamming the this, this GNSS or it was GPS by then, uh, signals that were coming from another direction of arrival. So we were able to actually detect that jammer and also mitigate it and get a better performance and basically test uh, research with real data, which with antenna rates is really, really challenging, I would say. So that's one thing. The other stuff that I want to mention is about somehow related to, we wanted to do detection and localization of interferences. And for that, we were using also the, the SDR. So let me give you Right, just one minute context about this. So there, there is these uh, civil air traffic control radars, right? That they are transmitting on on this band, 1.2 gigahertz, 1.3 gigahertz, right? If you rem go back to to the frequency allocation for GNSS systems, this is precisely in this area here, right? So this is an out of band interference for, for signals coming here, for L5, E5 signals. But we were, by then we were doing some experiments with the E6 band signal for, for Galileo, which is an encrypted signal that Galileo is, is going to transmit. So when we were recording this signal, we were seeing some, uh, some effects that, are, that were due to these ATC, this, this radar, these uh, airport radars. Uh, and then basically, you see here in this figure, we, we were able to measure this data using the SDR. And in general, this should look like white noise signal, but it has these pulses. So this pulse is because of this pulse uh, interference due to this radar. So we have some, some uh, uh, thoughts that th there was a radar somewhere in the, in the mountain close by, because this is a building that is very close to the airport in Barcelona. So we thought that there was a radar over there, so, so we actually wanted to, to localize it and see, and see if that we were right, right. So that was one part of, the, kind of the, this small project where we were able to detect that there was a jammer. Now we wanted to, to actually uh, that localize it. Right? So to detect it, we, we had this, all these signals that were extracted from the software radio. So these are all indicators about the signal to noise ratio, the tracking loops, the phase lock loops, all this internal stuff from the receiver that tells you that there might be something going on on the, on the signal. So this we were able to do it thanks to these logging tools from the SDR and then dumping them on, on MATLAB and, and, and processing, being able to do that. 
We also very quickly were able to implement a notch filter or a pulse blanking, sorry, to, to mitigate that interference in the receiver. That was relatively, that was very easy actually, given the, the modularity of the, of the software. And here you'll see, okay, if you are not into GNSS, probably these figures look very similar to the previous ones, but maybe here you'll see the bits. You can see the one and zero or one minus one. So it's kind of everything start working fine after we implemented the pulse blanking quite easily. So to detect the, to, to, to localize the, the radar, we were starting a different project there where we were using again this RTL SDR software, we were, uh, hardware, sorry, and, and we were using two of them. So we had like one, let's say, poor man's antenna array receiver. Uh, we were very, uh, especially um, into low cost solutions, as, as you can see. Uh, we built this, this prototype with these two antennas, right? Connected them to the RTL, RTL SDR, and then to the receiver or to the computer. So we were basically implementing music algorithms to do direction of arrival finding and then some grading method and, well, whatnot. So we were doing like basic going to different places, doing measurements for, for the directions of arrival, and then finally we were able to, it was kind of obvious that was a radar, but we wanted to make sure because then we were actually uh, reporting this to the authorities because that, that's actually creating some troubles for people trying to use these signals close by to the airport. So we're trying to see if they, because they were not actually, uh, how to say that uh, they were not complying with the power limitations that they had, basically. So we fill a, a, a report for the relevant authorities. Okay, that was the other part. And the last part, uh, the last application that I wanted to mention is how to actually, so all this software, all these applications I was mentioning, they run on the computer, a personal computer, that they might be more or less powerful Right, but in the end, they are limited in, in computational power. Even though you can still use uh, GPUs, and, and the software is is able to actually use GPUs if you have them. But sometimes going with these bulky computer, bulky computers, it's not the best, uh, you know, form factor. So you want to have something which is a bit more contained, and and that works in real time for many satellite signals that maybe have higher bandwidth. So one possibility is to go for embedded systems, right? So basically uh, run the Genesis SDR software on, the, on an ARM receive, on an ARM processor, and then offload part of the challenging operations like these correlations, FFTs, and whatnot, onto FPGA part of the embedded system. So this is something that is an ongoing work. Uh, basically, what we were doing here is precisely that. So in green, you have the software, the, the truly software part, let's say. And then in red, you have the more hardware part, meaning the FPGA part. So implementing all these computationally challenging aspects of the receiver, and then how to interact all of those. So for this, we were using the, the, the Zing platform that was already mentioned before also. And this, actually, this is actually a prototype implementing L1 and L5 uh, as a receiver using this uh, embedded system architecture where you offload part of the receiver to the, to the FPGA. All right. And this yells me to the conclusions. So basically, I, I was trying to share our experience on developing SDR for GNSS. Obviously, there are many similarities with communication systems or other of the works that, that you can see here in the posters. In GNSS particularly, it's kind of a confluence of different trends. So we have this open design trend, so not only for software, but also for hardware. So on the website, you'll see also some of this hardware is open source or open access. You can look at it and the schematics and see how we implemented all these things. Basically, these trends of software define everything, so now people go crazy, as we all know, about SDRs. And, and also, there's a trend for GNSS to have more and more signals coming in and more designs and more modernized signals as well. So, so we need something that is flexible enough to deal with all these changes. Uh, again, there, there's also some 
this right here, right now, right? So we have all these uh, hardware and codes and GNSS front ends that are relatively cheap and relatively easy to use. And we have, so we have all these free and open source uh, platforms and tools that we can use. So it's kind of also confluencing towards the GNSS SDR. And besides, once this is working, so we can use this SDR to, to tackle different, not only research problems, but also more industry problems, like enabling these GNSS signals to be easily deployed and implemented on, on receivers. There are a plethora of, uh, of applications that you can think of, ranging from space weather, interference, rejections, precise agriculture, and, and whatnot. So Genesis SDR is an open source project that is very popular. We have a lot of contributors from all over the place. And we have hundreds of people visiting the website and GitHub and, and whatnot. But there are a whole bunch of other softwares, not only receivers, but parts of the receiver or, or simulators, and all sorts of stuff related to GNSS and SDR, which is really, really amazing. So I would like to conclude just by pointing out to the website. There's a huge amount of information over there. Feel free to, to drop me an email or to join the, way, the mailing list of it. Also, there's an open discussion on, on there's also this, uh, the link for it, on the key performance indicators that I guess this is also something that extends to other so SDR receivers, not only for GNSS. So how, we, how do we measure the performance of an SDR? So there are several indicators for that. So we, we have an ongoing discussion on the website with people contributing. So feel free also to go there and, and and make sure that your, your voice is heard. And I think that will conclude my talk, so I will be happy to take questions now or offline. Thank you. Great, yes. Thank you for a very great talk. Uh, so you mentioned the issue of uh, uh, jamming detection, and I think the radar was the main example that uh, you presented as, as, a, as a potential jammer, basically. Mm -hmm. Have you experimented with uh, other forms of uh, GPS jamming? And if so, can you comment on uh, any of the results that you obtained? That, thanks, that's a very good question, very relevant. So actually, I skipped these slides because for a matter of time. That was not prepared. <laughs> so, so actually, building a jammer is relatively easy. And buying it, it's actually easier. So you can go to eBay, and for a couple bucks, you can get one of these jammers uh, that can destroy you know, GPS reception for kilometers. That's relatively easy. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of research on how to make receiver robust. So in that sense, in, in the, within the GNSS SDR software, we are implementing also testing method, robust methods to, to interferences and being able to test them with real data. So this is actually a very challenging problem because if you think of this, many of the infrastructure that we have in, in the countries, they rely on, on GPS. GPS is not only GPS, or GNSS is not only about positioning, it's also about timing. So it gives you a very powerful way of synchronizing things or, location or devices that are very far away, so you cannot connect them directly. So when you synchronize to this satellite, you are synchronizing to an atomic clock. So that's, that's really powerful. So for instance, the power grid, this is synchronized with a GPS. There are these uh, bank transactions, they are also timestamp with the GPS uh, timing. Wireless comm towers, they use GPS timing. All these things, they, they need to be really protected about this. And it's relatively easy. There's this uh, fun, let's say, fun incident some years ago. Probably you heard about this. I, have, I actually have this slide. So there was this truck driver that he built, he, he bought one of these jammers here, right, for 10 bucks or so, because he has his company were tracking where the guy was going. Well, not only him, it was a fleet management thing, no? But maybe he didn't want the company to know where he was going. So he bought the jammer, plugged it onto, onto the track, and then kept driving. But the bad luck was that the guy was driving very close to Newark Airport. 
And then the new, new airport authorities recognized that every week there was some sudden dropout of GPS. And then they didn't know what was going on, right? So then the FS, FCC that was start going, start doing an investigation. And after three months, they cut, they cut the guy, they find him and what not everything. But the, the the point is that this guy was not trying actually. The, he was not a bad guy trying to you know interfere GPS for everyone. He was just trying to protect his own privacy. But he was destroying everyone or the airports in this case. Uh, Useful use of uh, GPS. So there's a lot of ongoing research on that area. That's a very good point. If I might just quickly follow up. So, sure. so my question is related to jam jammers detection and potentially localization. Uh, I mean, it's clear that you know jamming GPS is 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 quite easy and it's quite doable. But just trying to localize where the jamming is coming from is the issue. Yeah, for that there are several works. So you can rely on multi antenna receivers, like for instance the ones I, I was mentioning before. So you can steer the beam and do direction of arrival and so on. There's also works on using uh, crowd sense data, so people moving around and detecting maybe an increase of power, and then how to fuse this data, that's, that's another challenge. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of a whole literature on that area. That's a very important topic. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Uh, have you implemented anything to do TEC measurement to electron content from uh, ionospheric uh, sources? And also, have you looked into the GNSSR, uh, uh, you know, uh, global reflectometer uh, uh, for the radar? Actually, using the GN, uh, using the GPS satellites or GNSS satellites as uh, radar illuminators. Thanks for the question. That, that's a very relevant question. So first is the ionospheric content. So also because background, so the, the signals are propagating through the ionosphere. And this part of the atmosphere is very, it's ionized, right? It's the name. So and then this changes the, the phase of the signal. And then it, it distorts the signal a lot. So then this needs to be uh, accounted for when you compute your position. Basically, in the polar areas, this uh, ionospheric effect is very strong, so you cannot rely a lot on, on GPS in that areas. Uh, we, are, we are actually developing uh, tracking methods that are able to detect ionospheric events and that can be robust to them. So the way we did it is we, we tested it, again, with our MATLAB simulator. Now we are porting them onto the SDR and testing them with uh, with uh, real data. So that's that's a, actually a very a very relevant aspect. There's a lot of interest on that, not only for aviation in the polar areas, but also in the equatorial region. There's a lot of scintillation events. And then the other question was about ref radar or, or reflectometry or how to use GNSS signals to uh, learn uh, things about the the Earth. No, so whether the salinity of the water or or the forest, or, or the soil, or this kind of stuff. So I know there's people in France using the software, or a version of the software, to do this kind of, of stuff. We, were, we are trying to start collaborating with them as well. And yeah, yeah, this, this will branch as a different, no, it will not be a different project, but it's slightly different because the architecture is, is different. You are not really interested in, in all the architecture that we need for, for the GNSS receiver, but you need to, to modify it slightly, although you can reuse most of, most of the blocks there. But yeah, that's, a, that's something, that's one of the nice things of SDR, that you can you know, play around with the, with the blocks. Great, any other question? Thanks again, uh, Paul, yes, sir. Thank you.